Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It is both a great pleasure and a great honor to be invited here on this occasion and to be uh, awarded uh, an honorary doctorate. So um, I just wanted to start by remembering the many different ways in which my work has had connections with the Swedish Agricultural University, particularly in Alnarp, from early days and work of landscape architects there, Per Gustafsson. Uh, my sponsor, Ingrid Sarloff herlin has been uh, a, a colleague and um, co-researcher for many years, and we've published together. Um, and I'm still trying to publish with people now uh, working in Alnarp, including Patrick Gran. I've worked with Eric Skurbach. I'm probably not pronouncing your names correctly, apologies. Um, but I visited the uh, campus here on one occasion in 2009, looking at all your wonderful research and the impact it has. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a context for my research um, and then talk about how I try and address some of the challenges of that context. So I know you all know, memorized, all the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and I have been doing some work for the World Health Organization European region, and they are very interested in these as well. And particularly, the nexus between good health and well-being, number three, and number 11, sustainable cities and communities. And you'll see that goal there, 11.7, is very much um, bringing together the idea of good, universal, inclusive access to green spaces, outdoor environments uh, for everyone. And the World Health Organization sees this as important for health. And I'll say a bit more about that. But of course, what we need in order to achieve that in terms of landscape is healthy life on land and life in water. I'm a landscape, uh, I'm not a historian, but I have taught landscape history for many years, and so I can't resist saying a little bit about the context within which we consider landscape and health, because this is nothing new. The ancient Romans in the first century in the Common Era were talking about Pliny, the, the elder was talking, and Marshall were talking about the benefits of green spaces within the urban environment, roofs in urbe and how a healthy town, a healthy urban environment was one in which you had the benefits of the countryside within the city. And um, we can have uh, discussions about which European country first introduced public parks. I know there's still some debate. We claim it in Britain, but I know a few other countries do as well. Certainly it was being discussed, the idea of urban parks as uh, healthy places for the increasingly urban population in London in Parliament in the 18th century, but it was really in the 19th century that this came to the fore. This is an image of one of the famous public parks bought by public money for public access. Uh, Birkenhead Park outside Liverpool opened in 1843. And if you see some of the quotes that were being, uh, the arguments that were being put forth for public parks, talking about diminishing the rate of death, adding quality life years. In public health, we now talk about quality adjusted life years as the unit of measure. But here we are talking about this in 1839, more or less in the same language, interestingly. And descriptions about the benefits of um, particularly uh, access to fresh uh, air, green space for people working in industrial contexts. Frederick Law Olmsted, working in the United States, was working with um, an English architect, Calvert Vox, on um, what became an iconic park, Central Park in New York City. And interestingly, he starts to talk about not only the physical health benefits of fresh air and a green space, uh, the chance to walk somewhere away from urban pollution, but also the mental health benefits of green space. And this uh, quote about harmful effects on mental and nervous systems, um, the uh, stresses and strains of urban life is very much resonant with what environmental psychology tells us today about some of the challenges of urban living. And for Olmsted and Vox, the antidote was pleasing rural scenery. 
modelled very much on English landscape, um, sheep grazed landscape, in fact, that was one of the models, pastoral landscape. This is a very famous uh, bit of landscape design, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, New York, um, designed very subtly to look like a natural landscape, but actually allow access, the paths are slightly sunken, so you see a continuous green sward, but actually there are paved paths crossing it, and there's a slight curve in the meadow, so it looks like it extends forever. And this other nice image of uh, an archway leading to that park from the carriage ride that goes round the park shows you this enticing park from outside, that apple green grass through the tunnel reflected in the wood that, um, uh, with which the tunnel is, is uh, clad. Um, very attractive, this green space in a, in a harsh urban environment. So, um, coming to the 21st century and my work, um, I work in a multidisciplinary team and with many clever collaborators. I'm, I'm privileged to work with many people nationally and internationally who bring different expertise to bear, including psychology, geography. Um, some of my health epidemiologist colleagues have developed evidence on the health effects, the salutogenic effects on human health of green and blue space. Um, there's a lot of evidence on physical disease and physical mortality rates. Um, and, of course, you have to take into account income level because, sadly, today it is still the case that your socioeconomic status, your income level, is one of the best predictors of how healthy you will be and how long you will live. So one of the other things that is interesting is that green space is equigenic, as my colleague Rich Mitchell has um, uh, coined the term, that uh, other things being equal, where you have more green space uh, near areas that are of poverty, you see less difference between the health of the rich and the poor than if there is less green space. So it reduces that health inequality that otherwise is due to income and, and socioeconomic status. And what's behind this, there are many different theories, and some people in LNARP have contributed really important work looking at the psychological benefits and the therapeutic benefits of green space. One of the most obvious ones is physical activity. Almost all of us are more active when we're outdoors than indoors. Uh, that's very much true for children, but it's true for most of us as well. Um, so getting out into the landscape can encourage us to walk more, to be physically active, and we know that's healthy for us. And we also know that being physically active is good for our mental health as well. It can be good for relieving stress, for example. But also social engagement is very important in our lives. Social isolation, particularly for older people, and we are an aging society with increasing numbers of older people, um, social isolation is an independent risk factor for health. So if we're someone, uh, often a woman, living alone in our 80s, um, in our own home, which we hope to still be able to do, uh, we may have very little engagement with neighbors or just people we see on the street unless there is an attractive outdoor environment that encourages us to use it. So outdoor, attractive green spaces also opportunities for social engagement. Attention restoration, I haven't got time to go into the details of all of these different theories, um, but essentially green space is very good for helping us recover from the stresses of either focusing on our computers every day when we're at work or the busy urban street, the urban environment that makes demands on all our senses. And there are also, and Patrick Gran is mentioned particularly here, and other colleagues from ALNARP, in understanding independent physiological responses that our bodies seem to produce uh, when we're in green and natural environments. So there is some suggestion that we are, in some sense, hardwired to respond positively to some aspects of the natural environment. And biological pathways in particular are of interest to the uh, public health professions. Um, there's increasing understanding of what chronic stress does to us physically. It, there's wear and tear on the body, and it appears that if green space can buffer this allostatic load, to use the, the health term, then that will really benefit us in multiple ways. And I've been involved in trying to develop some research which supports this. Uh, one bit of research that's been um, much uh, 
publicised <coughs> was for the Scottish Government, where we'd be looking at links between deprived urban populations, people of working age but not in work, um, economically deprived. Um, we measured uh, stress patterns and we measured independently um, by mapping how much green space there was around their home and we could predict healthy stress patterns by how much green space there was around their home. We, we were really quite surprised that we could do this. Um, it, uh, we were looking at healthy cortisol patterns, which when you're healthy, go up steeply in the morning in the first 30 minutes after waking and then drop steeply during the day. And it was uh, a disruption of these healthy patterns that we noticed in people, more so who had uh, less green space around their home. And this received a lot of attention, partly because we had used uh, an objective measure, both of health and of green space. But we are great believers in my research uh, centre in multi-methods. Um, we don't just test people. We always talk to them and we ask them how they feel, because that's very important too. And each of us is the best person to say how we feel and how healthy we think we are. So we also uh, interview people, we uh, ask them how they feel about their life, their environment, and we found that social well-being uh, seems to be one of the links between green space and health. So a sense of place belonging predicts lower stress, and that is related to green space around the home and in the neighbourhood. And similarly, perhaps not surprisingly, having access to a garden or allotment predicted lower stress, but was also linked with place belonging and social connectedness. So you can see this is actually quite a complex thing, this link between green space and health. Um, multiple different factors probably all interacting to produce the salutogenic benefit. Much of my research has been with older people, but I've also researched with children, teenagers, different ages. And over many years, we've been looking at what encourages people to get out more at all ages. Um, some early work, not surprisingly, perhaps showed that older people, like the rest of us, um, even into very old age, um, are more likely to be physically active, healthier, and satisfied with life if they have an outdoor environment that is attractive and easy to use. And in landscape design terms, we're interested in what kind of design features might encourage you to use a green space near where you live or discourage you. These examples are not encouraging. Um, I've done a lot of work with the Forestry Commission in Scotland looking at environments that are designed to look welcoming or not. So these are some examples from could do with some more work. Uh, we've also used, I haven't got time to go into the details, but graphic analysis that we've also trained non-experts in, although landscape architects will be very familiar with some of these techniques, trying to map the experience of walking through a woodland. What are the opportunities? What are the views? What are the places where you might feel too enclosed? So mapping that experience and then thinking how we can enhance it. And thinking about uh, good examples of design um, that are welcoming, that say, you're welcome here, please come in. I even if you're in a wheelchair, you could come into this woodland. It will be an attractive place and you will be able to get around. And uh, a good design can do this without even needing signage itself to say so. Uh, the, uh, one of the recent projects that I've just finished, uh, we're in the dissemination phase of, Mobility, Mood and Place, was particularly focused on older people and we've been using a range of different methods, as I said, very much collaborating with lots of different disciplines to explore older people's access outdoors and how to make it enjoyable and easy. Um, Co-created environments, very important. As I said, we always believe in listening to our participants and not just testing them and helping uh, understand how the good ways that uh, work best in helping older people from different communities to engage with the design process, to understand it, and to make meaningful contributions that are uh, appropriate to their own lives. Uh, we've been working on this in a number of different contexts. Urban Manchester, Hackney Wick in London, very near the um, Olympic developments in London, Edinburgh, of course, my home city, and then remote rural Scotland in the Orkney Islands. Uh, so our master's level students have been working with us on some of these, and this image is just from one of our architecture students. Um, again and again in this research, the thing that came out was access to nature, 
very, very important for people's well-being, access to other people, that social contact, and access to light, to natural light, to bright spaces. And this illustration is just one image of the kind of space that allows you to see what's going on out there, to step out, to engage with that wider social uh, context, but also to retreat, perhaps, to just watch it, but not to have to be involved if you decide the weather's not right or you're not quite feeling up to it and underlining the importance of that interface between the building and outdoors, which is so critical to good design and good use of outdoor space. Uh, I don't expect you can read all of this. It's really just to say that we've produced an A to Z of co-design as part of disseminating our work to non-academics. It's been very well received by different organizations and charitable trusts interested in working with older people or indeed communities in general. Uh, and engaging them in design process. Um, it's been translated into French and Spanish, not yet into Swedish, but you never know. Um, one of the other parts of, of this uh, very big research project has been using um, these mobile neuro headsets. They receive a lot of attention. The press is always very interested in these. This is one of our mature PhD students wearing this headset, which measures um, essentially neural activity, brain activity, while you're out and about in the real landscape. We are very interested in research in the wild, in the real environment. It's not very good at the detailed mapping of different parts of the brain, but it is good at very precise timing of when different activities, neural activity is happening. So as you walk through an environment, we can see at what point perhaps different changes in that activity are triggered. Um, we also use ethnographic methods, just to underline that mixed method approach, we talk to people, we ask them to tell us how they feel about walking in these different places. These were all um, people over 60, some, someone I think in their 80s, possibly even in their 90s, who volunteered to participate in this, which was great. Um, and we looked at urban green environments, urban quiet environments, so residential streets, perhaps with gardens in front, and busy urban environments with uh, shops, um, traffic, whatever. And we found that we could predict, um, again, from these patterns, these neural patterns this time, when people were moving between a green, urban green environment and an urban busy environment. Uh, I haven't got time to go into the details. I can share references afterwards if you're interested. But this underlines, among other things, uh, or supports attention restoration theory. And just to give you the qualitative support for that, um, people told us that they found it relaxing getting into the green space after the um, busyness of the urban street. And equally, when we asked them about their experience of the urban street, well, you're going to feel a bit more self-conscious with one of those funny headsets on top of your head, um, but also it's a busier place. Uh, and the third aspect of this particular project um, looked at environmental histories. This is a first, as far as we know. We're in the process of getting this published. Um, and we've mapped for people born in 1936 who are part of a group being researched in our university as they age. So for more than the last 10 years, as they move from their 70s into their 80s, they've been undertaking, uh, uh, involved in a lot of research. What we were interested in was where they lived at different stages in their life from childhood, and then look at what influence the environment seems to have on them at different stages in life. It's very difficult to do. We've used what information we had, not always easily available, but there is a, a very detailed survey of Edinburgh uh, physical environment that was undertaken post Second World War. So we have some, this is one example, a map of housing condition. We've looked at medical reports, so we can see something about population densities in the urban environment in Edinburgh and the Lothian region um, in the early decades of the 20th century. And uh, we've mapped green space, that obviously of particular interest to me. Um, access to green space at different stages from childhood, adulthood into older age. And we found, interestingly, that childhood access to green space isn't associated with cognitive decline um, until we get to over 70. And then we start to see the effect of childhood access. And that is accentuated if people also had good access to green space in adulthood. <coughs> Um, but this long-term link between access to different environments, healthy or unhealthy, 
and old age. This was um, looking at cognitive decline, but you can see there's also research on anxiety and depression in older age, which can be big challenges for us as we age. Um, so very interesting cutting edge work there, looking at environmental histories. I was involved, um, fortunate to be invited by the Scottish Government to be involved in an evaluation of um, a pilot project that was undertaken to look at these links between environment and health a few years ago. And this government pilot looked at uh, just four childhood health outcomes, obesity, unintentional injuries, asthma, and mental health and well-being. Um, and I was involved not in, in doing the research, not, not all my areas of expertise at all, but in the evaluation group that looked at the so what of all of this research gathered together. What does that mean for how our environments should be developed and managed? And to my delight, um, almost all of those um, headline recommendations you can see have got a good quality open space at the heart of them. Uh, and you wouldn't necessarily think that would be the recommendations that come from those childhood health outcomes, um, but good access nearby home to places that children can uh, enjoy the natural and the green environment are very important. That was very exciting, and that led to um, the place standard being launched in Scotland, among other things, um, interestingly being promoted both by our health service and by our architecture and design uh, Scotland um, organisation that for government recommends and oversees good quality design. And it's interested in the place where our lives are, uh, are carried out and the place, the physical environment and the social environment and the economic environment that, that is experienced in place that makes a difference to our health. It's early days yet with this. I'm involved in some of the um, discussions about implementation and, of course, evaluation. So, one of the challenges for us as we move forward in Scotland is what about people who don't have a good childhood experience of access to green space? Many people here will be fortunate enough to have had that, but not everybody does, particularly deprived urban communities. And a project that I'm just finishing now, just writing the report for and starting to publish, looked at another kind of longitudinal study focused on very particular communities rather than a population level epidemiological scale. And we were interested in whether changes to woodland, physical changes, so the kind of thing we as landscape architects are very familiar with, whether that would make a difference, or whether you needed some kind of community engagement, social promotion as well, to make a difference to the community mental well-being. Um, these are just very rough images of, of some of the kinds of interventions, not grand, big, wonderful designs, quite modest interventions, which the government is very interested in precisely because they don't cost a lot of money. Um, so uh, it, you might say, well, how, how could this possibly make a difference to community well-being? And, and there are some challenges to that. The social engagement involved artists, as you can see some examples here, and also family fun days, different kinds of events that would try to engage the wider community in their local woodland. And the question really was, you know, do we need physical inventions? If you build it, will people come? Or do we need social interventions as well to make a difference? The answer is probably both. I don't expect you to get your head around all of the details of this logic model, but really just to describe these kind of models are very important in helping us think about the mechanisms by which the physical environment might make a difference to health. And the answer is yes, people tell us the environment was enhanced through these interventions undertaken by Forestry Commission Scotland. Yes, the social support for environmental use was very much appreciated by the people who did go along, but they were in a minority. Um, we've seen some change in behaviour. People are visiting more natural environments after the intervention compared to the control. And some of them are enjoying those woodlands more in terms of views. Some evidence of changes in physical activity, more moderate levels of physical activity, just a little bit, but anything is better than nothing. Connectedness with nature, yes, we see that, and possibly a greater sense of community cohesion. These are small effects, significant but small, in a very large study and a large sample. Sadly, we didn't find the health outcome we were most looking for, which was lower stress levels. Um, so more work needed, um, but a very interesting study and one that I said we're just trying to publish now. 
So I'm going to finish up just with a few slides that um, summarize um, some of the work I did for WHO European Region about links between urban green space and health. I was part of this, uh, contributing to this report, and I was asked to talk to advisors to European ministers on the importance of green space and health. I had a 10-minute slot in a big meeting of these advisors in Skopje a couple of years ago, trying to get them interested in it before they produced the final program that was discussed, uh, I think, in June 2017, finally, by the ministers themselves. Uh, they were also interested in interventions. So trying to summarize this in a very succinct way, we need an ecology of green space in our cities, I think. Nearby greenery that we can look out of the window at where we're working, very important particularly for mood and stress relief. We need small places near to where we live, where we work, where we play, where we can undertake all different kinds of activities depending on what life stage we're at. Uh, we can argue about whether these should be public or private or semi-private, but they need to be near. And of course, if we're going to be encouraged to be healthy and active into older age and enjoy walking and cycling, we need attractive places to do that, not busy streets with pollution um, and unpleasant experience as we ride or walk along. So that green infrastructure, very important for many reasons, but one of them is for human well-being. And then, of course, we need those larger open spaces, of which you have so many wonderful examples in Sweden. Um, for big events, big festivals, large community gatherings or family gatherings, but also nature study, education, biodiversity. And where does a city need it? Near, there needs to be somewhere close by to where everyone lives, um, within five minutes walk at the most, um, so that everybody has access to it. And we need places that are commonplace where we can grow things or children can find out about nature. There's a lot of interest in the microbiome and engagement with the soil and plants and what that does for our immune systems. And also wilder places where we can have a bit more wild fun out in nature as well. Thank you. <laughs>